All right, we are going to begin the meeting now. Welcome everyone. Um, thank you for joining tonight. Uh, we also wanna note one more time, closed captioning is available by selecting the closed caption icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen if you're using the Zoom web portal or the Zoom app on your computer. I'm just going to give it a few more seconds here. It looks like we've still got people joining. All right, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, we'd like to welcome you everyone to tonight's meeting for the Ivory Build Woodpecker. I'm Megan Stone with EMPSI Environmental Management and Planning Solutions, a contractor for the US Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, we are going to head, go ahead and get started, and I would like to thank you all for joining us. We appreciate your time and participation. I'm going to be one of your facilitators today for the meeting, and additionally, I have several members of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service today on the meeting, who we will introduce in a moment. We're going to move into the meeting agenda for tonight. Um, First, we'll go over some brief ground rules for tonight's meeting. Then we'll have our U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service presenters introduce themselves and begin their presentation. Fish and Wildlife will provide a PowerPoint presentation on the proposed delisting, which will last approximately 20 to 30 minutes. We will then begin our verbal public comment portion of the meeting starting at 6.30 p.m. Central Time and the verbal public comment portion will last until 7.30 Central Time. So before we get started with the presentation, I'm going to go over some ground rules for the meeting. First, this meeting is being recorded as part of the project record and a recording will be posted to the US Fish and Wildlife Service website. Second, your microphones and videos will be turned off for the duration of the meeting today you will only be unmuted if and when I unmute you during the comment portion of the hearing. After the PowerPoint presentation, we will then move on to the public comment portion, during which we will accept verbal public comments from participants who have joined today's meeting. If you registered before the start time of today's meeting and indicated that you would like to offer a verbal public comment today, you received a separate email stating that you would be called on during today's meeting to provide your verbal public comment. If you registered after the meeting started, we'll do our best to reserve some time for you to have an opportunity to offer your verbal public comment tonight. If we have time remaining after we have gone through our list of pre-registered commenters, we'll open up the comment portion to the everyone on the meeting and anyone who would like to provide a comment who has not already done so, regardless of whether you selected yes or no to commenting when you registered for today's meeting. If you do not get the opportunity to offer your verbal public comment today, written public comments can be submitted at regulations.gov and we'll provide further information on how to submit your written public comments after the presentation. So now I will turn it over to Melissa Lombardi from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, who is going to start off the presentation. And then Amy Trahan will lead us through Fish and Wildlife's PowerPoint presentation. I'm going to go ahead and um, ask Amy and uh, Melissa to mute, unmute themselves now. Hi, Amy, you should be unmuted now. And yeah. Melissa, you can go ahead and unmute yourself and turn on your video as well.
Melissa, you might be double muted. I'll go ahead and ask you to unmute one more time. Got there it. we go. Great. Thank you so much, Megan. Good evening. My name is Melissa Lombardi, and I'm the acting field supervisor for the Louisiana Ecological Services Field Office. I'd like to welcome you to the public hearing for the proposed rule to delist the ivory billed woodpecker. We appreciate your interest and engagement with this charismatic species, and we look forward to hearing your comments this evening on the proposed rule. I'd like to introduce Amy Trahan, the species lead biologist for the ivory billed woodpecker. She'll be presenting an overview of the species ecology in the comment process. Amy? Good evening, I'm Amy Traha with um, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, I'm out of the Louisiana Ecological Services Office and I will go forth and start the presentation. Next slide. During this presentation, we will offer information about the agribilled woodpecker the service's proposal to remove it from the list of endangered and threatened wildlife under the Endangered Species Act and explain how the public can comment on this proposal. Next slide, please. We will begin with some background information about the ivory-billed woodpecker. The species was first described by Mark Catsby in 1731 under a different toxin taxonomic nomenclature but the current scientific name is Campophilus principalis. The ivory bill was known as the largest woodpecker in the US and the second largest in North America. It was described as having a black and white plumage with a white chisel tipped beak, yellow eyes and a pointed crest. They were sexually dimorphic. Females had a solid black crest and males were red from the nape to the top of the crest with an outline of black on the front of the crest. They also produce distinctive sounds such as the Kent call and double knocks. Next slide, please. Ivory bills excavated both nest cavities and roost cavities and both sexes incubated the eggs as well as fed the young. An important component of their diet appeared to be large beetle larvae. They also had large home ranges and extensive forested areas and required these large areas of the forested habitat. Next slide, please. The required habitat for the ivory-billed woodpecker is extensive forested areas with old growth characteristics and naturally high volume of dead and dying wood. And as an example, virgin bottomland hardwood forest. These extensive areas of habitat historically occurred in the southeastern US. The map on this slide indicates areas of bottomland hardwoods as well as the species historical range. Next slide, please. One factor that contributed to the decline of the population of this species was the clearing and demolition of virgin forests in the US, southeastern US between the 1880s and 1940s. Without this required habitat to support healthy populations, the ivory bill numbers declined. Another contributing factor of the decline of the species was, was the pursuit of the species by local hunters and professional collectors from 1890 to the early 1920s. Next slide, please. Ivory-billed woodpeckers were thought to be relatively widespread throughout the southeastern U.S. prior to European settlement. Following this settlement, a long-term decline in habitat for the species began in the early 1800s. By the early 20th century, essentially all of the historical range was affected. There was a gradual decrease in specimen and site records through the early 1940s, with the last commonly agreed upon sighting occurring on the Singer Track in the Tensaw River region of Northeast Louisiana. There was also a reported sighting at the Cache River National Wildlife Refuge in 
Next slide, please. Why do you list due to extinction? First, it fulfills a statutory responsibility. In a number of provisions, Congress made clear that an integral part of the statutory framework is for the service to make delisting decisions when appropriate and revise the list accordingly. The ESA requires the service to revise the list to reflect recent determinations, designations, and re revisions. We review the list at least every five years determine based on those reviews, whether any species should be delisted or reclassified, and if so, apply the same standards and procedures as for listing. We conducted the most recent five-year review for the ivory-billed woodpecker in 2019. The second reason for the service to proceed with delisting decisions when appropriate is a pragmatic reason, efficiency. Delisting species that will not benefit from protections because they are extinct allows us to allocate resources responsibly for on the ground conservation efforts, recovery planning, five year reviews and other protections for species that are extant and will therefore benefit from those actions. The third reason for the service to proceed with delisting decisions when appropriate is to serve the public by making wise use of agency resources and it also allows us to provide the public with more accurate information on species and their rate of extinction. How do we set, assess a species for delisting due to extinction? We use the best scientific and commercial data available at that time and look at three common factors, detectability, survey effort, and time since last detection. Some species may also have other considerations that should be taken into account during this process. What do we mean by extinction? Extinction means no living individuals of the species remain in existence. A determination of extinction will be informed by the best available information to indicate that no individuals of the species remain alive, either in the wild or captivity. Next slide, please. What are the three factors considered for delisting? First one, detectability. The ivory bill produced distinctive sounds and had distinctive markings, such as the large white patch on the wing that can be seen from long distances, which indicate a certain degree of detectability during surveys. Second is survey effort. The reported 2004-2005 sighting at the Cache River National Wildlife Refuge a five-year survey effort in Arkansas. This reported sighting also prompted other survey efforts that were conducted throughout the species historical range from 2005 to the present. Those survey efforts are described in more detail in the service's 2019 five-year review for the ivory-billed woodpecker. And lastly, the time since last detection. The last unrefuted sighting of the species occurred in April 1944 on the Singer Tract in the Tensaw River region of Northeast Louisiana. Next slide, please. Because of the ivory bill, woodpecker can look similar to other avian species. This is a good guide that can be used to distinguish between an ivory bill and other bird species of similar appearance. Next slide, please. The services reopen the com public comment period and will accept comments received or postmarked on or before February 10th, 2022. The public can submit comments and view all documents related to the proposed rule at the link below. The service welcomes all comments, but we are particularly seeking comments on encounters or observations with documentation. These encounters or observations should be able to be repeatedly interpreted the same way by independent observers. If you need any of the web links or email addresses in this presentation, it will be available online. Next slide, please. 
If you have documentation or information you would like to submit in addition to written or verbal comments, regulations.gov accepts the following file types, PDF, JPEG, GIF, MPG2, TIFF, text, Excel, and WebM. Any videos, photographs, or recordings that are in a file type that is not accepted by regulations.gov may be emailed to ivorybuildwoodpecker at fws.gov. Next slide, please. For our next steps, we will review all comments and documents submitted and make a final determination on whether to either proceed with the action as proposed to delist the ivory build woodpecker due to extinction or to withdraw the rule, proposed rule. The determination that is made will be published in the Federal Register. This concludes our presentation and I will now turn it back over to Megan. Thank you so much, Amy. We're going to turn it over to Clayton McGee, who's gonna be the primary moderator for tonight's public comment portion. Great, thank you, Megan. We are now going to officially start the verbal public hearing portion of today's meeting to receive comments related to the proposed rule for the ivory build woodpecker. It is 617 central time, so let's get started. Again, this is verbal public comment portion of the meeting, along with your comments is being recorded as part of the official record. As a reminder, your camera and mic control settings are restricted during this time. You will only be able to talk if and when you are unmuted. So please remember to speak when prompted. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service will not be answering questions tonight, but we encourage you to submit your written public comments outside of this verbal public comment hearing. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service wants to hear from all members of the public, so we will be using the following guidelines today. First, please be mindful of the length of your comment so that everyone who wants to speak has an opportunity to do so today. Second, please be respectful of others and their viewpoints. Third, please refrain from using profanity. While passion is welcome in your comments, policy requires that we mute anyone who uses foul language because we are recording this meeting and others may be live streaming. So please avoid inappropriate language. If that does happen, we'll provide a reminder before unmuting the person to try again using words acceptable to ears of all ages. Next slide. I'm now going to read through the instructions for those participants who indicated they wanted to offer a verbal public comment when they pre-registered for today's meeting. We have a list of these participants. Commenters will be accepted in the order that people registered. Again, if you registered before the start time of today's meeting, you received a separate email informing you that you would be called upon to offer your verbal public comment. This email also included your place in the commenter list. If you are on the commenter list, when it is your turn to provide your comment, we will read your name aloud from the list and display your name on the screen. We will also display the name of the commenter who is next in line. When you hear your name called out, please use the raise hand feature so that we know you are available and ready to offer your comment. You can access the raised hand feature by clicking on either the reactions icons or the participants list icon, which are both located at the bottom of your Zoom screen. If you wave your mouse back and forth across the bottom of your screen, these icons should appear. You may need to exit out of your full screen Zoom view to see these icons. You can then select the raised hand feature located either in the reactions icon or at the bottom of your participants list. Or if you are one of our phone callers today, please remember to press star nine to access the raised hand feature if it is your turn to provide a verbal public comment. Once you have raised your hand, you will then be unmuted so that you can provide your verbal public comment. You may be double muted. If that is the case, we will prompt you to unmute yourself on your end so that we could hear you. Please spell your first and last name for the record before providing your verbal public comment. And if you are re representing an organization or group, please say so before you begin your comment. After you have provided your comment, we will mute you and move on to our next commenter. 
Again, once we have worked our way through the current list of pre-registered commenters, if we have time, we will move on to those who registered after the start time of today's meeting, who selected they wanted to offer a comment. If we still have time remaining after we have worked our way through those participants, we will open the verbal public comment portion of today's meeting to anyone who would like to offer a comment today who has not already done so. Commenters may not cede their time to other commenters during the meeting. Next slide. On the screen, I have included some graphics showing participants where they can access the raised hand feature on Zoom. Once again, um, if you are in full screen mode, you might have to exit out of that to see some of these. Um, I know that older Zoom versions tend to use the image that's on the right under the participants tab and newer Zoom versions have the reactions icon that will allow you to raise your hand. And with that, we're gonna go ahead and get started with our first commenter today, our first public commenter today. So our first public commenter is Matt Cortman. Matt, I do see that you've raised your hand. I'm going to ask you to unmute yourself and please let me know if you can hear me. I can hear you, thank you. I can hear you too. Could you please spell your first and last name for the record and if you represent an organization, please. Matt, M-A-T-T, -T, Cortman, C-O-U-R-T-M-A-N. I represent two groups. The first is the Louisiana Wilds. The second is Mission Ivory Bill. Great, your time has begun. As a person who requested this hearing, I thank Fish and Service, Fish and Wildlife for the opportunity. However, I'm disappointed that there probably will be no colloquy between those of us who have researched ivory bills and those in the Fish and Wildlife Service who are proposing this rule. If you want to cure that, you can come to one of uh, Mission Ivory Bill's Zooms. One specifically for this topic will be on February 7 at 7 o'clock uh, Central Time. My name is Matt Cortman. I'm a former Louisiana ornithological president who has been interested in the ivory billed woodpecker for over 50 years. In the fall of 1969, at 10.30 on an LSU football Saturday night, the incomparable Dr. George Lowry opened the LSU Museum of Science to a then unknown to him eight-year-old boy and his father. That magical event was significant for two reasons. First, it cemented an interest in ornithology in me, and it forged in me a passion for the ivory bill that burns as bright in me at 60 as it did when I was eight. Second, and much more important for tonight's purposes, the world-renowned ornithologist, Dr. Lowry, stated to me the operative fact which, with all due respect, should have presented, prevented the proposed delisting due to extinction rule from ever being drafted. To my question of Dr. Lowry, do you think the ivory bill is extinct? He looked me dead in the eyes and said, Matthew, no one can answer that question. The ivory bill's deep swamp forest home has not been adequately surveyed to know that. The same was true in 1969 as it was in 1937 as it is in, in 2022. I respectfully request that the proposed rule be withdrawn. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comment, Matt. I'm gonna go ahead and put you back on mute. With that, we're going to move to our next public pre-registered commenter, John Fitzpatrick. John, I do see that you have raised your hand, so I'm going to go ahead and ask you to unmute yourself and please let me know if you can hear me. Give me one second. You just disappeared from my list. There we are. Can you hear me, John? Yes, uh, I just unmuted. Thank you. Great. Could you please spell your first and last name and if you represent an organization, please? Thank you. John, J O H N, Fitzpatrick, F I T Z P A T R I C K. I'm speaking as an independent uh, professional ornithologist with a 52 year career. Uh, I have worked as the director of the Cornell Lab of Ornithology in Ithaca, New York, but I am speaking as, a, as an independent 
scientist uh, with extreme familiarity uh, in avian ecology and conservation biology. Great, thank you. Your time has started. My basic uh, uh, statement is that this is a premature uh, proposal. Um, it's based on, uh, although we have huge respect for the Fish and Wildlife Service and for all of the individuals and effort that you are all undertaking with uh, very inadequate resources, um, the species status assessment on which this proposal was based uh, is, is very light and very superficial with regard to particularly its casual dismissal of a number of pieces of evidence that this bird still exists since 1944. Uh, a feather that is uh, documented to be an ivory woodpecker found in 1969, the 2004 2005 evidence. Uh, the US Fish and Wildlife Service itself concluded in 2010 that the evidence did not uh, support uh, delisting. And the species status assessment on, on which this proposal is based does not actually make a scientifically valid uh, case for eliminating the evidence that ex exists since 1944. Uh, the question I would ask is if one of those uh, sightings or records, for example, the Arkansas record in 20 in 2004 were deemed to be uh, uh, accurate or valid, would this delisting proposal still hold? I think not, that's certainly implied in the delisting proposal. So the probability still exists that any and perhaps multiple of these records uh, are valid, therefore it's premature. Uh, when Amy read her uh, lists of, uh, of criteria, she talked about delisting when appropriate. This is not an appropriate time yet to delist this species. Um, allocation of resources was mentioned. There are very few resources time. being acknowledged uh, to the ivory woodpecker. Serving the public, um, we you definitely will serve the I'm public. I'm gonna go ahead and have to put you back on mute, John. Great, thank you. With that, we're gonna go ahead and move on to our next uh, pre-registered commenter, Thomas Hyder. Thomas, I don't see you in our participants list today. So if you're one of our phone callers, could you please access the raise hand feature using the star nine button on your phone keypad, if that is you. And I'll just give it a few more to see if Thomas is one of our phone callers today. Once again, please press star nine on your phone pad. And I'm not seeing uh, any of our phone callers access the raised hand feature. Um, so with that, we're gonna go ahead and move on to our next pre-registered commenter, Alan Mueller. Alan, if you're on the call, please access the raised hand feature. And I'm not seeing Alan on our participants list today. So if you are one of our phone callers, once again, please press star nine. And it doesn't look like we're getting any participants on our phone callers using the star nine feature that could be Alan. So with that, we're gonna go ahead and move on to our next commenter, David Lanou. David, I do see that you have access to your hand, raised hand feature. So I'm going to ask you to unmute. Please remember to spell your first and last name for the record and if you represent an organization. Yes, my name is David Luno. It's D-A-V-I-D-L-U-N-E-A-U. Um, I was involved in searches in Arkansas and Louisiana, but I represent just myself here. Great, thank you. Your time has begun. The ivory bill woodpecker has been deemed extinct by some people at least several times in the past 120 years, and each time has defied those who would write it off. We should not make the same mistake again. In 1971, 
Fielding Lewis shared photos of ivory bills with George Lowry, an ornithologist at LSU. Dr. Lowry shared those with fellow ornithologists at an AOU meeting, only to be ridiculed for supposedly being duped. After all, wasn't the ivory bill extinct? In 2004, Gene Sparling observed an ivory bill in eastern Arkansas, starting a search effort that led to sightings by 15 different people, most of whom were trained field ornithologists and some of whom would be considered woodpecker experts. Some of the 15 observers were skeptical about the presence of an ivory bill until they saw it. After all, they had read in some field guides that the ivory bill was extinct. I suppose if you are all in invested in the thought that the ivory bill is, is extinct, then photos, videos, and sighting reports can all be dismissed with some mental gymnastics like calling each and every one of them cases of mistaken identity or wishful thinking. One final thought, the Fish and Wildlife Service's 2010 recovery plan for the bird states in Appendix B regarding the interpretation of the video I took on April 24th, 2004, and I quote, after weighing the various positions, the FWS accepts the interpretation of Fitzpatrick et al. FWS concludes that other published interpretations by Sibley et al. and by extension Collinson are based on misinterpretations of video artifacts as plumage and novel interpretations of typical bird flight, end quote. So I don't understand why the service would now fall back on the mistaken belief that the last time this bird was reliably observed was in 1944. There's far too much evidence to the contrary, including evidence that the service accepted only 12 years ago. The service should avoid the embarrassment and the liability of declaring the species extinct when it's not. Thank you. Thank you for your comment, David. I'm going to put you back on mute. With that, we're going to go ahead and move on to our next pre-registered commenter, Fred Barazzi. Fred, if you are on the call today, um, I do see you on our participants list. So I'm going to go ahead and ask you to uh, unmute yourself and please remember to spell your first and last name and if you represent an organization. Fred Verizon, hello, F-R-E-D-V-I-R-R-A-Z-Z-I, -Z -Z -I. can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Fred. I'm a zoologist with 40 years field and academic experience in ornithology, ecology, and entomology. I represent National Biodiversity Parks, incorporated a federal nonprofit, permitted to do various ivory bill woodpecker studies in the past. As president, director, and zoologist, our federal nonprofit has conserved, researched, and documented tens of thousands of animals, inclusive of presence, absence, determinations, and population estimates. As a science officer with the federal government, I have pledged to protect the natural resources of the country with integrity, and I take that oath seriously. As lead investigator, the department, as lead investigator, the Department of Defense and National Park Service have granted our teams permits to perform U.S. Fish and Wildlife based endangered species surveys, including many projects specifically designed to detect ivy bill woodpeckers. We plan, funded, and performed 14 acoustical survey expeditions for ivy bills in four states for attraction to a netting point. During these studies, we acoustically covered 160 square miles and 200 total square miles by all methods. Total area, 128,000 acres. It took several thousand hours to accumulate varied information at approximately 650 points. We had at least six definite ideal woodpeckers acoustically and one sighting associated with a DK in three states. An ivory bill woodpecker tented 150 feet from three of us in South Carolina. We were all, we are all experienced birders placing in top, top awards for various fundraisers, including the World Series of Birding several times. A half a mile away on subsequent day, on a subsequent day, an ivory bill flew out from the base of a tree and later decayed back in response to our ADK. Our data set provides a total Southeast US population estimate. No other entity that, that the US Fish and Wildlife presently has data from has anything similar, but we have not been contacted. Upon finding a 300% encounter rate disparity between our survey methods and Cornell Lab of Ornithologies, their project designer was contacted. Their method was 14 ADKs in six minutes. Ours was three ADKs in five minutes. The mobile team was also unnecessarily burdened with substantial field data collection impertinent to actually finding IVOs. An IVO gives only a few acoustical signals in a week. See tempo spatial data by Hill et al. Florida. Distracted surveyors chasing pictures of Swainson's warblers Counting, uh, counting. End of your time, Fred. 
County, that's the end of my time. Hmm. Why couldn't? With that, we're going to move on to our next pre registered commenter, John Williams. John, if you are on the call, uh, please access the raise hand feature. And I do see that you've done that. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and ask you to unmute yourself and please spell your first and last name and if you represent an organization for the record. Yes, my name is John Williams, J O H N W I L L I A M S. I am associated with Mission Ivory Bill at the current time. Great. Thank you, John. Your time. My comment. Started. Yes. Since the year 2000, eight expeditions have searched for the Ivoryville woodpecker and have reported encounters. These were by professionals with advanced degrees and professional organizations. They have obtained documentation. Critics of the documentation and evidence have taken the stance of being cautionary, as they should be, but not dismissive. Close study of the evidence shows that the critics have been addressed. Cornell Ornithological Lab, sightings and audio evidence with sonograms matching known Ivory Bill Kents. David Leneau, encounter with video that shows Ivory Bill field marks. Auburn University, sightings and video with analysis that shows Ivory Bill field marks. Extensive audio of double knocks and Kent sonograms that match Ivory Bill. This was done by Dan Menel's lab. Mike Collins, sightings and three separate videos with morphometric analysis that show Ivory Bill field marks. Audio analysis of Kent sonograms and double knocks that match Ivory Bill math-based evidence published in peer-reviewed journals. Bobby Harrison, video of bird with field marks matching Ivory Bill. National Biodiversity Parks, multiple encounters with extensive data sets. Project Coyote, sightings and multiple still images of birds that match Ivory Bill. Guy Leno, math analysis of image. Kent sonograms that match Ivory Bill. Most recently, Mission Ivory Bill, most recent sightings of bird, including this year. These are eight separate efforts in eight different locations that have found evidence of the bird since 2000. Thank you. Thank you, John. And we would like to remind everyone that if we have time, we will circle back to commenters. However, due to the number of commenters and an effort to give everyone an opportunity to speak, we are giving each commenter two minutes to provide their comments. So once again, uh, we will circle back to commenters if there is time remaining. With that, we're going to go ahead and move on to our next pre-registered commenter, Ezra uh, Hotch. Excuse me if I pronounced uh, your last name incorrectly. Um, and I don't see any Ezra on our participants list today. So Ezra, if you are one of our phone callers, uh, could you please access the raise hand feature using the star nine button? And I'm not getting any raised hand features from our participants on the phone today. So we're going to go ahead and move on to our next pre-registered commenter, George Obert. George, if you are on the call today, please access the raised hand feature at the bottom of the screen. And if you're one of our phone callers, please press star nine on your keypad. And I do see that we just got a different phone caller with us. So um, if this phone caller happens to be George Oberts, uh, please access your raised hand feature using the star nine feature. And we'll just give it a few more seconds to see um, if that in case is him. Once again, that is star nine. But it doesn't look like the phone call that just joined us is going to end up being George. Um, so we're going to go ahead and move on to our next pre-registered commenter, Timothy Barksdale. Timothy, if you are on the call today, please access the raised hand feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And if you're on the phone, please remember to press star nine.
And it doesn't look like we're getting any raised hands from uh, someone who might be Tef Timothy. So with that, we're gonna go ahead and move on to our next pre-registered commenter, Dan Dullum. Dan, if you are on the call, please access the raise hand feature. And I do see that you are in our participants list. So I'm gonna go ahead and ask you to unmute yourself. Please remember to spell your first and last name and if you represent an organization. Hi, this is Dan Dullum, D-A-N-D-U-L-L-U-M. Uh, I do not represent an organization. Great, thanks, Dan. Your time has begun. In the comments I provided during the original comment period, I identified two statements in the Federal Register notice that are incorrect. Both are in regard to the sightings and audio recordings made by Cornell in 2004 and 5. The Fish and Wildlife Service said that Cornell had determined that the recordings do not constitute evidence of the presence of ivory-billed woodpeckers. They also said that by 2013, the ornithological community determined that these sightings could not be confirmed. The cited references contained in the notice contradict these statements. The implication of these false statements is that others who may have evidence of the existence of the ivory-billed woodpecker could be dissuaded from sharing their evidence since they may decide that their information is contrary to the entire ornithological community and any evidence that they provide would be not be taken seriously and would be dismissed. I don't think it is appropriate to proceed with delisting without issuing a corrected Federal Register notice. It currently has false and misleading information which could suppress the public's involvement in the rulemaking process. Instead, I would recommend that you spend more time doing additional research, setting criteria for determining what constitutes credible evidence and taking a fresh look at evidence that has been obtained in the last 20 years. Most importantly, go deep into the woods of areas where ivory bills have been seen. Work your way through the swampy hardwood forest, past the snakes and alligators, into areas where few people go. Not because you will see an ivory bill, but so that you will get, you will see the difficulties and getting to their habitat and the near impossibility of seeing a rare, quiet and elusive bird in such an environment. It will demonstrate the need for patience while waiting for further evidence of the existence of the ivory-billed woodpecker. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. And with that, um, Megan, I did just get a message from Mark that he was saying that um, he will submit written comments and he will not be speaking. So we could go ahead and move on to our next pre-registered commenter after Mark. Thank you, Clayton. Our next commenter is going to be Kellen. Kellen Flanagan. And I'm not seeing Kellen on our participants list today. So Kellen, if you are one of our phone callers, please remember to access the raise hand feature using star nine on your phone. And it doesn't look like we're getting any raised hands from Kellen. So with that, we'll go ahead and move on to our next pre-registered commenter, William Simpson. William, if you are on the call, and I do see you on our participants list today. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and unmute you. Uh, please remember to spell your first and last name and if you represent an organization. Once again, I'll go ahead and ask you to unmute yourself. You might be double muted, so you should get a prompt on your end, uh, William, that should allow you to unmute yourself. And once again, William, um, I've asked you to unmute yourself. Um, so you should be getting a prop prompt at the screen. And you might need to hit unmute in the bottom left of the screen. Um, 
if that's causing you any issues. Once again, William, um, I've asked you to unmute yourself. Um, you might need to press the mute and unmute button on your left side of your screen again. Um, if you're having audio issues or anything, um, why don't you go ahead and message me or Megan Stone um, and we'll work to try to get that resolved and we'll circle back to you so you could make your public comment. Um, with that, we're going to go ahead and move on to our next pre-registered commenter, Kelly Kraft. Kelly, if you are on the call today, could you please access the raised hand feature? Or if you're one of the phone participants, please remember to press star nine. And I'm not seeing Kelly on our participants list today, and I'm not seeing that any phone callers have also accessed their raised hand feature with that. Um, I'll give it a few more seconds to see if we get a phone call that raises their hands that could be Kelly. But I'm not seeing that. So with that, we can go ahead and move on to our next pre-registered commenter, Alan Gert. Alan, if you're on the call today, um, please access the raised hand feature at the bottom of your screen. And if you're one of our phone callers, please press star nine. And I'm not seeing Alan on our participants list today, nor am I seeing a raised hand feature. So with that, we're gonna go ahead and move on to our next commenter, Michael Perez. Michael, if you are on the call, um, please access the raised hand feature and star nine on your keypad of your phone. And it doesn't look like I'm getting any raised hands from our phone callers. So we're gonna go ahead and move on to our next pre-registered commenter, Ashley Hopkins. Ashley, if you are on the call, and I do see that you are on our participants list today and you raised your hand, I'm gonna go ahead and ask you to unmute yourself. Uh, please spell your first and last name and if you represent an organization, please, thank you. Hey there, can you hear me all right, Michael? Or, I'm I can sorry. Hear you. Oh, you're good, I can hear you, Ashley. Oh, great. Um, my name is Ashley Hopkins. So that's A-S-H-L-E-Y-H-O-P-K-I-N-S. Great. Your time has begun. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, so I am uh, with no organization. I live in Tallahassee, Florida, um, in the vicinity of the um, habitat of the ivory-billed woodpecker. And I just wanted to speak today to say I think the delisting of this species is premature. I think there's ample evidence to show that um, there's a pot that, that it's still out there. Um, and by delisting it, we're only further putting it in peril um, and putting its habitat in peril. I'd also like to say, I, I, don't, I, I don't think there's any argument that um, this animal has found itself in this situation along with many other animals um, because of the theft of indigenous land and the development and greed of people um, developing their land. And this animal is sacred to indigenous people and it has been for time immemorial. And I think we have an, a responsibility to the indigenous community um, to do what we can uh, to preserve this sacred animal um, and that uh, many mistakes have been made um, and many of those by settlers and European settlers. And I think we have a moral responsibility to do absolutely everything we can to preserve this animal, not only for itself, but for the people who've been living um, with this animal as a sacred species um, since time immemorial on this continent. Thank you. Thank you for your comment, Ashley. With that, we're gonna go ahead and move on to our next pre-registered commenter. Um, and I do apologize um, if I mispronounce your name here, um, but I see it's Rashawn, uh, Vinahara, I do see that you've raised your hand, um, so I'm going to go ahead and ask you to unmute yourself. Please let us know if you can hear us. 
Hello. Hello, Rasan. I can hear you. My name is Roshan Vignaraja, R O S H A N V I G N A R A J A H. Great. Thank you. Your time has started. Um, I would like to make three points about the delisting of the ivory billed woodpecker. First, there is ample evidence to suggest that the ivory billed woodpecker is not extinct. The five year review that was commissioned in 2019 did not look at the evidence correctly. It reviewed some videos, such as Mike Collins's, just as inconclusive, inconclusive because they were blurry. However, the Blurriness aside, they can be confirmed as it was. Um, photos taken by Project Principalis in 20, 2009 and 2011 show ivory bills. That can, this can be looked at using a neck um, width length ratio measurement, which shows that ivory bills have a, um, a ratio that is two times that of the pileated. The range of the ivory bill also needs to be rethought. The range map made by Tanner is too small. And today, however, that would be a good area to search nowadays. Um, thank you for letting me present. Oh, yes. Great, thank you for your comments. We're gonna go ahead and move on to our next pre-registered commenter, Barry Bennett. Barry, I do see that you have raised your hand. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and ask you to unmute yourself. Uh, yes, good evening. Good evening, I can, I can hear you. Um, my name is Barry Bennett. First name is B-A-R-R-Y. Last name is B-E-N-N-E-T-T. -T. Great, thank you, Barry, your time has started. All right, um, this ivory bill woodpecker controversy is a, uh, it's a moral issue. Um, it's not just about a bird, but um, this is a moral issue because I think um, many of the people I've talked to say that the, uh, the proposal to do list is, uh, is just as much about the critical habitat designation that is associated with the ivory bill as it is with the bird itself. And I don't know uh, how many of you have been to the South recently, but um, the wood pellet biomass industry is making a huge push for Southern forests. Right now, they've been working on, on private land in the South uh, for a few years now, but at the rate they're going, they will run out of potential, uh, potential, potential forest. And during the Trump administration, Officials, uh, corporate officials, CEOs from companies like Drax, a, 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 an English company, a company called German Pellets that has a headquarters in Wismar, Germany, a company called Inviva. Uh, I know they have an office in Berlin that I've seen. These corporations put a lot of pressure on members of Congress and on people in the Trump administration to open up public lands in the South. Now, these are these are these were a political appointees. I'm not talking about the science, but there's been pressure put on political appointees during the Trump administration, an administration that was notoriously hostile to the ESA, and all. And they made no bones about it. They would some of the Trump administration openly discussed ditching the ESA. Um, these these forests are being logged. They're being sent to wood pellet mills. Then they're processed. Then they're shipped, put on barges, sent sent to our ports in the Gulf of Mexico and in the southeast. Then they, then our forests are loaded onto these are loaded onto ships and sent 6,800 miles to power plants in the UK, power plants in the Netherlands, in Belgium, to be burned in coal fired power plants that have been modified to burn our trees. Have been modified to burn wood pellets. So what we're doing is we're cutting our southern forests and selling them to uh, and, and people are selling them to power plants in the UK and in, in the Netherlands and in Belgium. Now, how does that sit with you all? Sit, think about that. Your just time just, has I'll, ended, Barry, but I'll just remind you that we're going to go ahead and open up to um, to allow people to make some more comments uh, once we finish our list of pre-registered commenters.
Um, with that, we're going to go ahead and move on to our last pre-registered commenter, Judy. Judy Chucker, sorry, my bad there. Um, Judy, I do see that you're on our participants list, and I do see that you actually did just message me that you will submit your comments in writing. Um, and so with that, we've reached the end of our pre-registered commenters. I'm gonna go ahead and turn it back over to Megan Stone, and we will circle back now to some of the people um, and allow them to have some additional speaking time. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Clayton. At this time, we're going to um, give everyone a moment who uh, signed up to provide a comment, but maybe wasn't on when we called on you originally. Um, so we're gonna give people a moment to do that. After that, I'm gonna go into my Zoom web portal and check to see if anyone has registered after the start of the meeting and look to see if anybody um, has registered and would like to provide a comment. After that, um, then we are going to open it up to those who would like to provide a comment but may not have indicated so when they registered. Um, and then after that, um, if time allows, we're going to let people who uh, didn't get to finish their comments uh, uh, come back and speak a second time. So with that, um, our first commenter that um, was pre-registered but we didn't hear from uh, was Alan Mueller. Alan, if you're on with us, could you please access the raise hand feature? Still doesn't look like Alan has joined us. Um, so the next uh, speaker who was pre-registered that we didn't get a chance to hear from is David Leno. David, if you're on, can you please go ahead and access that raise hand feature? Again, it doesn't look like David is on with us. Um, so we're um, going- Megan, I do see that he is uh, on the oh. participants list. Yeah, there he is. Awesome, David. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Clayton and he's going to um, facilitate the public comment for you. Great, thanks, Megan. David, I do see you on our participants list. So I'm going to go ahead and ask you to unmute and please let us know, uh, spell your first and last name and if you represent an organization. And I have asked you, oh, looks like you are unmuted now. Can you hear us? I can hear you fine. Can you hear me? I can hear you, David. Well, I, I, I spoke most of my piece already, but there were a few other uh, citing reports that uh, I wanted to throw out that I didn't have time to. Uh, John Dennis in, in the late 1960s, John Dennis was a well-known ornithologist. He had firsthand experience photographing Cuban ivory bills, obviously not the kind of guy who would mistake an ivory bill. He found ivory bills in East Texas in the late 1960s and was uh, somewhat dismissed by, by others as uh, wishful thinking. Um, in 1999, David Cullivan watched a pair of ivory bills at very close range for several minutes in Louisiana, reported his observation to, uh, to Van Remsen at LSU. Um, and then also just a few years after the Arkansas sightings uh, by Gene Sparling and others, there were well-documented sightings, sound recordings, and videos from the Florida Panhandle and from Southeast Louisiana. Um, there, there are many others. I, I, I'm sure most of the people on this call know, know about a lot of those. And I just wanted to say that, uh, again, I, 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 I think, in my opinion, the ultimate arrogance in birding is the act of telling someone else what they did not see. And these people who, who are, are, are otherwise thought to be top-notch ornithologists and birders reporting ivory bills seem to be dismissed by, by others. And I'm, I'm not sure what the reason for that is, but I, I find it, uh, I, I would find it personally very offensive. And that's all I've got to say about that. Thank you for, thank you for the opportunity. Great, thank you for your comment, David. With that, we're gonna go ahead and circle back to Ezra. Ezra, if you, Ezra Hosh, sorry, my bad. Uh, Ezra, if you are on the call, please access the, and I do see that you are on the call and it looks like there's some, oh, I do see that there's audio now on your end. So that's great. 
Um, I'm going to go ahead and ask you to unmute yourself and please remember to spell your first and last name and if you represent an organization for the record. Oh, I think you might have just muted yourself. Um, I'll go ahead and unmute you again, Ezra, and let me know if you can hear me. I do see that you're unmuted. Can you hear me, Ezra? Yes. Ah, great, I can hear you. Could you please spell your first and last name for the record? My first name is Ezra, it's spelled E-Z-R-A. And my last name is Hosh, spelled H-O-S-C-H. Great, Thank, as, thanks Ezra, your time has started. I think when we need to consider whether the Ivory Bill Woodpecker should be delisted or not, we first need to consider whether the evidence it meets an ornithological standard that would be considered acceptable documentation. No documentation would ever pass a reasonable records committee or eBird review process and has not since at least the 1960s when audio was recorded in Texas. If the species is going to be delisted, I think that this has met, it, it's met the standard there's been no evidence at all in the past 60 plus years and all arguments that have been presented are either based on sentimental values, non-conclusive data, or the ar argument that the habitat won't be protected if the ivory bill woodpecker is delisted. Thank you. Great, thanks for your comment, Ezra. We're gonna go ahead and move on to our next commenter that wasn't on the call before. Um, just give us one second, George. George, if you are on the call, could you please ask George uh, Oberts, my bad. Could you please access the raised hand feature at the bottom of your screen? Um, and if you're one of our phone callers, George, please remember to press star nine on the phone and that should uh, let you you know, raise your hands. Um, and I'm not seeing a George uh, Oberts coming on right now. And I don't see out of our participants with their hands that have raised them. I'm not seeing them. Um, so with that, we'll go ahead and move on to our next pre-registered commenter that uh, we went over, Timothy Barksdale, Timothy, if you're on the call, could you please access the raised hand feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen? Or if you're one of our phone callers, please press the star nine button on your keypad. And I'm not seeing any of our phone callers raise their hands or anything. Um, so with that, we're gonna go ahead and move on to our next commenter that we need to go over. Um, and it looks like that's Mark Bonta. Mark, if you're on the call, could you please access the raised hand feature? And I do see that you are on the call. Um, on our participants list. Oh, my bad. Um, Mark says that they will submit their written comments. My apologies, Mark. Um, so with that, we're gonna go ahead and move on to our uh, next commenter, Klein Flanagan. Klein, if you are with us now, um, please access the raised hand feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen, or please press star nine on your keypad if you're one of our phone callers joining us.
And I'm not seeing a Klein uh, raise their hand or one of our phone callers. So with that, we're gonna go ahead and move on to our other pre-registered commenter that might not have been on earlier, Kelly Craft. And I'm not seeing a Kelly Craft on our participants list today. Um, so once again, Kelly, if you're on the phone, please access the raised hand feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Okay, with that, we're gonna go ahead and move on to our other commenter that we might've missed over, um, Alan Gert. Alan, if you're one of our, if you're on our participants list today, I do see that you are on the participants list today. Um, so I will go ahead and ask you to unmute yourself if that works with you and please Remember to spell your first and last name and if you represent an organization. Okay, is it coming through? Yes, I can hear you, Alan. Okay, my name is Alan Garrett, retired uh, naturalist and curator of uh, two Audubon museums and done recent research on birds for uh, as a bird bander for over 30, 35 years. Hey, um, I think the listing of the endangered or of the ivory-billed woodpecker as a extinct species is premature. With the research that was going on, I do realize that uh, there have not been any activities seen uh, in the past, uh, say, five, 10 years, but I have been um, out, I was in the peninsula of Florida with uh, the now deceased uh, artist naturalist John Ruffin and Devere Burt, which led teams into that area. And we did have what we believe were credible uh, uh, glimpses as well as sounds and such of ivory bills. I am also in the process of checking a historic record from a friend of mine in the Savannah, Georgia area. I believe that although the Aubrey Bill may be gone, I think we need to have time to uh, continue to search and give protection to these areas and continue to look for uh, possibilities and have a thorough job done by as many researchers as possible in the field um, before this conclusion of extinction is given to this uh, species. Uh, thank you very much. Great, thank you, Alan. We're gonna go ahead and move on to our uh, other commenter that we might have missed earlier, or maybe they weren't they weren't on the call when we asked. Um, and that's gonna be Alan. Kurt, Alan, I do see that you're on our. Wait, and it's actually gonna be Michael Perez. Oh, my bad. My screen is not refreshing like it should on my end. Um, my apologies, everyone. So Michael Perez, Michael, if you are on the call today, um, please remember to access the raise hand feature at the bottom of your screen. And if you are on our participants list, please remember to press star nine. And I don't see Michael on our participants list today. And I don't see that our phone, one of our phone callers has not raised their hands either. Um, with that, we're going to go ahead and move on to our last uh, commenter that pre-registered that we might have missed over today or they weren't present when we called their name, Judy Chucker. Um, Judy, if you're on the call, I do see that you are on our participants list today. Um, just give me one second. But I remember that you are submitting your comments in writing. So with that, we will... Uh, we are done with our pre-registered commenters today, um, and we are going to move on to our next part um, and allow people who spoke earlier to have some more time to speak. Uh, Megan, did you want me to turn it back over to you? Yeah, thank you, Clayton. Uh, so at this time, we're gonna give each person who has already spoken one more chance to speak, and they'll be provided another two minutes but we would still like to give people who haven't had an opportunity to speak yet a chance. Um, so if you go ahead and raise your hand, 
we will try and get to you first before we get to the people who have already spoken. Um, so that looks like, I don't think we've heard from um, Kevin Perazzini yet. Um, Kevin, if you'd like to provide your comment, we'll go ahead and move to you now. Great. With that, um, it looks like Kevin, you are unmuted. Can yeah, you hear us, I Kevin? Am, I am off mute. This is awesome. Thank you. Um, name is Kevin Perazzini, K E V I N P E R O Z E N I. I just wanted to come in really quickly. I probably won't take the whole time. Wanted to say thank you um, for setting this up and, and going through all the trouble and stuff and having to hear everybody. Um, I feel like a word I've been hearing a lot tonight is premature, that like the delisting is premature. Everything we're doing is premature. But the last credible sighting has been in, you know, 80 years ago, something like that. It's been a while. It's been plenty of time to search through all these mystical swamps um, and bogs and wetlands to try to find a very large and supposedly very loud woodpecker. Um, I haven't seen any or heard any credible evidence. I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I was a kid just as all of you. I wanted it to be true. I spent hours searching the websites and searching, you know, evidence to see, is this true? Is this, you know, really still alive? But at some point or another, you gotta accept that it's extinct. Um, and I'm glad the USFWS has taken the stance and delisted it. Um, so wherever those funds or, you know, work or people that this bird's taking up can, can go to better birds, ones that are not actually extinct yet. So thank you. Um, and I think you did a really good job. I think you've done all the work you need to, and I'm glad you made this decision. So thank you. Thank you for your comment, Kevin. We're going to go ahead and move on to our next commenter. Matthew Sarver. Matthew, I do see you with your raised hand. So I'm going to go ahead and ask you to unmute yourself. Uh, give me one second. The, the hands are jumping all over the place. Sorry about this. Give me one second. Um, there we go. Matthew, please let me know if you can hear me. Okay. That seems to work. Yeah, I can hear you, Matthew. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, didn't didn't plan on commenting tonight initially, but I'm uh, just listening uh, this evening and I uh, wanted to go ahead and um, go on record. I was a member of the original uh, the, the 2004 2005 Cornell Ivory Bill uh, search team in Arkansas, spent about five months down there in the big woods and the habitat um, looking for the species, did not have any uh completely convincing sightings myself, but I did have some um, interesting possible sightings um, that I can't discount as not ivory bill woodpecker. Uh, I've heard some double knocks, saw uh, at one point one very interesting bird um, that I couldn't relocate. Um, you know, having spent five months doing this every day, seeing tons of pileateds, uh, working through those habitats, it's an exceptionally difficult habitat, as others have mentioned, to um, to even stay on a pileated woodpecker, for instance, um, I can see where potentially a low density uh, population of ivory builds could be overlooked. Um, I would agree with a number of the other commenters that the deal or that the um, extinction um, uh, proposal was premature. Um, I do think, importantly, uh, with regard to what the last uh, commenter said, you know, this is essentially a flagship species for some really incredible. Uh, southern hardwood forests, and uh, there is value in continuing to protect these habitats in the event that this species is rediscovered in future search efforts. Um, so, you know, can we say it's out there right now? Um, no, um, but it certainly is, uh, the searches have not been exhaustive at this point. I should say also, uh, commenting on my own behalf, but I, I do have about 15 years as a professional ecologist, uh, certified senior ecologist. Um, so, yeah, I uh, would urge the service to uh, hold off on the extinction uh, decision at this point. Great. Thanks for your comment, Matthew.
I'm going to go ahead and move on to our next commenter, Dale Gribble. Dale, I do see that you have raised your hand. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and ask you to unmute yourself and please spell your first and last name and if you represent an organization for the record. Oh, I think you might have just uh, muted yourself again. Um, I've asked you to unmute yourself once again. Um, hopefully you get that prompt on your end and you might have to click the in the bottom of the left screen where the mute button is um, when I'm doing this as well. And I'll go ahead and try this one more time with you. Once again, Dale, I have asked you to unmute on your end um, and you might have to press in the bottom of your left screen once that comes up. And please make sure you are connected to your uh, computer audio. Uh, your microphone is connected to your computer. Sometimes I know that can be an issue when people are joining Zoom meetings. Should be in the bottom left of your screen. There's a little up arrow and it says select microphone. Um, and then you can choose the microphone that you're using, um, should be your computer audio. Once again, I'll try to unmute you one more time. And it looks like we're still having some issues with this. Um, so why don't you go ahead and message Megan Stone, um, what issue you're having? And we will try to work with you to resolve that so you could provide your public comment. With that, we're going to go ahead and move on to our next commenter, Matt Cortman. Matt, I'm going to go ahead and ask you to unmute yourself. Give me one second. Can you hear us, Matt? I can, thank you. Great, we can hear you too. Uh, I wanna correct many misstatements, but I, I don't have time in two minutes to do it. But like many others, I know that the ivory bill woodpecker is not extinct. The idea that we keep dismissing uh, eyewitness testimony, we execute people in this country for eyewitness testimony. Whether or not that's proof is up to y'all to decide, but there's so much uh, eyewitness testimony. I have more than eyewitness testimony. David Leno made a great point earlier when he said the people in Arkansas who saw the ivory bill prior to them seeing the ivory bill were skeptical, as was I, even after I'd audio recorded the ivory, what I think to be three ivory bills for over three hours. In 2017, I recorded one in 2018. And then in 2019, I saw ivory bills on two occasions one on February uh, 18, 2019, and a pair on uh, March 10, 2019. I have no doubt about the identifications. And I've seen an ivory bill as recently as November, last November. It was November 20. Anyhow, what's really frustrating about this is the disparity. Those of us who claim we've seen ivory bills, we never get a fair hearing. And I appreciate that y'all have allowed this hearing, but I'm disappointed that, for instance, we want to get to talk to Amy Trahan in a public setting since she's the Ivory Bill cert, uh, expert for the service. If Amy would do that, that would be great. We've had great talks. Um, like many others, I know the Ivory Bill's not extinct. I am so confident of that that my wife and I moved back home to Louisiana in 2019 to organize an effort to save the species. We're gonna do that over the next five years with searches. Uh, Approving to others that the ivory bill is not extinct is understandably difficult. To acquire better evidence of the ivory bill's persistence is one of the main goals for a five-year search. Thankfully, proving the ivory bill exists has nothing to do with defeating this rule. All you have to look to is the conclusion of the 2016 technical report that you have in your possession. It says that it is premature to, de to declare the ivory bill woodpecker extinct. I ask that the service follow its own records and drop this delisting proposal. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comment, Matt. And with that, we're gonna go ahead and move on to our uh, next commenter. Um, before we go ahead and move on to our next commenter, I just wanted to circle back to Dale really quickly because I do see that Dale did come back and join the uh, participants list. Um, and I know he was having some audio issues. so. 
I'm going to go ahead and ask you to unmute yourself one more time, Dale. And it does look like you are unmuted this time. Uh, thank you. For thank you, my call. Great. I can hear you, Dale. Great. Uh, my name is Dale Gribble, D-A-L-E-G-R-I-B-B-L-E. -E. Great. Your time has started. Well, as a previous caller said, uh, we do have uh, penalties in this country for less than eyewitness testimony. We have plenty of eyewitness testimony in this case. So I think we should continue. Thanks. That's all. Great. Thanks for your comment, Dale. With that, we're going to go ahead and move on to our next commenters. Um, Matthew Sarver, I do see that you have your hand raised. Um, and then it looks like after Matthew, we can move on to Fred Verazzi. Uh, Matthew, I'm going to go ahead and ask to unmute yourself. Please let me know if you can hear us. Oh, I do see you already went my bad. Um, yeah, sorry. I, yeah, I already. All good. <laughs> thank, um, you. Th thank you, though. Appreciate it. Uh, with that, we're going to go ahead and move on to our uh, other commenter, Fred. Fred, I see that you've lowered your hands, but if you still would like to uh, make a comment, um, could you please, there you go. Great, I'm gonna go ahead and ask you to unmute yourself. Can you hear me? I can hear you, Fred. Um, you might wanna talk a little more into your phone so we can hear you a little better, um, but I, I can hear you. Subject, the 208 Louisiana Ivory Bill Woodpecker video. NBP has partially completed the first unbiased independent review of this video. U.S. Fish and Wildlife has recently said that this, that the author said this was not conclusive for Ivory Bill Woodpecker. This is not true. The, uh, the uh, video in question lacks aesthetics, but it is strikingly beautiful work of nature to scientists and all of us. The video is full of ID information and is proof of recent ivory bill woodpecker existence. Someone should download it at the U.S. Fish and Wildlife and we will go over it. The bird is unequivocally a spectacular ivory bill woodpecker. We shall present video sequences, frames, and discussions soon. We will send the link to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife. Subject, wing bee frequency, pileated woodpecker versus ivory bill woodpecker. These two species flap rate does not approach overlapping each other in powered level flight. The literature on this is unequivocal. There is not one pileated woodpecker of the thousands of videos that flops like the two ivory, wood, ivory bill woodpecker videos in question. That is Arkansas and the Louisiana video just mentioned. Implications, subject, implications of the Imperial Woodpecker films of 56. They completely support that the two U.S. videos are Ivy Bill Woodpecker and not Pileated Woodpeckers. Please withdraw this extinction proposal. Inexpensive management for the Ivy Bill Woodpecker needs to start immediately. NBP, with its entomology and ornithology experience, has completed the initial project design to start working on the management of the species. This species is worth 50 to 100 million dollars in ecotourism money if it's properly managed as the valuable resource it is. It's time for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife to begin understanding this species. They have been wrong for 80 years, and others also, some of us have been wrong. It's time to hold hands and move forward. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you for your comment, Fred. Um, with that, there is only about six minutes left. Um, so if anyone has not provided a comment who would like to provide a comment, please raise their hand. Um, and I do see that Ezra has raised his hand again. Um, so Ezra, I'm gonna go ahead and unmute you and you can, you can uh, speak, my bad, sorry there. And then we're gonna go to Hannah Hunter after Ezra. Can you hear us, Ezra? Yes. Great. I would like to counter some of the claims about eyewitness testimony. Eyewitness testimony is generally considered the worst kind of testimony. And everything that has come forward from the ivory bill woodpeckers has all been very, very, under very difficult circumstances to evaluate the bird identification. 
these have been brief, they've been obstructed, or they've been distant. Secondly, a lot of these claims about the magical flap rate are perplexing because we have no original flap rates from Iberville woodpeckers to confidently state that pileated woodpeckers and Iberville woodpeckers placed a fur in any significant way. Finally, if they're so easy to detect or if they've been detected so many times, I can't think of a single species that has such a low rate of detection to physical documentation. There are many species in the United States that are very difficult to detect visually, such as black rail, but people can get photos of black rails every year. I think the evidence is clear that, ivory, that the ivory-billed woodpecker is unfortunately no longer with us in the lower 48. Great. Thank you for your comment, Ezra. Um, we're going to go ahead and move on to our next commenter, Hannah Hunter. Hannah, I'm going to go ahead and ask you to unmute yourself. Give me one second. And let us know if you could hear us, Hannah. And please spell your first and last name and if you represent an organization for the record. Um, yes, I can hear you. Um, it's H-A-N-N-A-H-H-U-N-T-R. Um, I'm a PhD researcher at Cornell University, but here I'm just representing um, myself. Great, your time has started, Hannah. Okay, I just wanted to make a really quick uh, comment. I wasn't planning on saying anything, but um, I just wanted to echo something that um, someone said earlier about inconsistencies in the report that needed to be um, corrected before um, we went any further. Um, as someone who researches this topic in detail, I've noted quite a few inconsistencies, which I'll put in um, a written response as well, one of which based on detectability, um, which is one of the main things that um, your proposal is based on. Um, and for instance, um, Arthur A. Allen and Peter Paul Kellogg, who um, in the 1930s were some of the last people, as you say, to have credibly seen um, the ivory bill woodpecker, um, they in uh, articles said that the ivory bill woodpecker was actually not a very detectable um, species at all. Um, and kind of outlined various reasons because of that. Um, and yeah, and that's just one of the things that um, I believe to be inconsistent in the report and should be fixed um, before going any further. Thank you. Great, thanks for your, oops, sorry. I didn't mean to unmute again, but um, thanks for your comment, Hannah. Um, and once again, we just wanted to thank everyone tonight for providing their verbal public comments. The US Fish and Wildlife Service really does appreciate it. Um, and with that, I'm going to go ahead and hand it back over to Megan. Thank you, Clayton. Yeah, we just want to say thank you again, everyone, for participating and joining. Um, I do see that some people are still joining the meeting. We've had a few people join in the past 10 minutes, and so I just wanted to provide an update for those people. Um, we have reached uh, the conclusion of tonight's meeting and we have worked our way through the pre-registered list of commenters and opened it up um, for some folks to uh, provide additional comments. Um, at this time, we're going to pass it over to Fish and Wildlife Service for some closing remarks, but we do rem wanna remind everyone that um, you're strongly encouraged to uh, submit the remainder of your comments in writing um, on the screen here, you can see where those can be submitted. Um, please feel free to uh, let us know anything that you um, weren't able to finish. We were working with a long uh, list of um, commenters and a high uh, rate of participation tonight. So we do appreciate everyone working with the two minute limit. Um, and now I'm going to turn it over to Melissa for some closing remarks. Melissa, you should be able to unmute now. Thank you, Megan. And thank you to all our participants in tonight's public hearing. We appreciate the comments, the passion, and the expertise shared with us. We will carefully consider all comments presented here tonight and those submitted to regulations.gov. So thank you again, and you'll have a good night. Thanks, Melissa. 
I'm going to stop the recording and end the meeting now. Thank you, everyone. And uh, real quick, um, we did have a message from Ashley Hopkins, and she asked if we could copy and paste the link in the chat, and we're going to do that right now. Thank you for asking, Ashley. I'm going to put that in there. Um, that's where everyone can go and submit their comments. And um, we also do want to remind everyone that the recording of this meeting um, will be posted uh, after the meeting ends and it will be posted to the US Fish and Wildlife website. Thank you all.